focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. CNBC TV 18. Marquee Nights. Mumbai edition of CNBC TV 18's Marquee Nights, your host Anuradha Sen Gupta is in conversation with Yannick Balore, the chairman of Vivendi and chairman and CEO of the Havas Group. Get ready for insights on how one of the world's largest global communications groups is looking to make a meaningful difference to brands, businesses and people. Catch him unplugged as he shares his thoughts on media, metaverse and mass. So Yannick, it's a privilege. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you very much for having me and thank you to everyone for attending uh, uh, this event tonight. Okay, please, can you say that in French? Because anything you say in French sounds wonderful. Merci beaucoup d'être ici ce soir à toutes et à tous. <laughs> that was an easy question. Thank you. <laughs> I think you can do all your answers in French and no one will mind, no one will care about what I ask and what you say. You just keep talking in French and we are okay, we are good, we are done. Your expectations of the Indian market, especially in the current context, would be very high. Is that fair to say? In terms of the growth that you expect from here? You know, in terms of growth, even if it's slightly slowing down, it's still a plus uh, 15%, something like that. When you compare to what we see in the rest of the world, like uh, Europe, you know, in Europe, when we have a plus 2%, maybe a plus 3%, it's a record year. So, I mean, in terms of growth, India is no comparison with the rest of uh, the Western world. So, uh, I still have huge expectations. I think we will continue to invest in India. Uh, now we have uh, 1,200 people. We are finalizing an acquisition that will uh, make us being a group of 1,500 people, I would say, uh, before spring. And I believe, I mean, in five years from now, we can be five, maybe 10,000. I mean, uh, the growth here in India, the, the opportunities are, are immense, uh, whether it is on the Indian market itself, but also in terms of India as a hub yeah. for the entire region. Yeah. Uh, you have business, of course, of us as interests in China. Yeah. And we saw how the pandemic has upended uh, the way the world sees China and the global supply chains and, you know, how they're designed. And there's a lot of work and changes happening there. So do you think there's an opportunity for India that's, you know, that, that's even bigger than what it always had because of its demographics and because of, you know, the government that we have and the kind of dynamism that the political leadership is providing? Right, uh, it's a great question. No, of course... Uh uh, China has had, I would say, a, a different strategy to uh, manage a pandemic. Uh, I would say a more closed one, uh, if I may say, more protective one. So it has uh, uh, slowed down the, the growth. Um, honestly, I think it's, it's a good opportunity for India because uh, in terms of uh, services, uh, in terms of uh, talents, India is very strong. In terms of manufacture, manufacturing as well, could be a great opportunity uh, for India. So no, I believe uh, India is a land of uh, huge opportunities for all the Indian uh, population, but also for the world and for the business, uh, global business like uh, the one we are operating in. Uh, I'll do a couple of questions on Havas because that is Vivendi's biggest interest in India. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people here are familiar with Havas uh, and the teams that work here. A few years ago at Havas, you created the Havas village model, right? Um, it seems quite intuitive what you did, which is that you took all these functions that uh, media and advertising agencies provide, you put them under the same roof, and you fostered this very collaborative spirit. Now, how different is this from the existing or the traditional model before that? And what were the challenges in making this happen? What were the challenges that you had to encounter to create Havas Village? Well, thank you for saying that it is very intuitive. We were the first to go down that path uh, eight years ago. Uh, I mean, the idea is most of the time, you know advertising agencies, uh, I mean, communication groups, uh, advertisers, they are very self-centric most of the time. 
So they think about their own organization and they expect uh, clients or prospects to adapt to their organization, to their silos. Uh, I arrived in advertising. I, I didn't have any advertising background. I was, I was a media guy. I was working in the media business. I was a TV uh, producers and a TV programmers, uh, movie producers, stuff like that. Mm. So when I arrived, my first reaction was to go and meet with the clients to try to do this kind of qualitative analysis. So, uh, so you're working with us. What's working well? What's not working? I came to see some prospects because I had a lot of friends who are CEO not working with Avas. Why are you working with this agency? Why not with us? And the common thing that they were telling me is, you know, the problem, the, the big pain point with advertising agencies is that you are too complex. You have silos, you have different agencies, you don't collaborate with one another. The media teams, they don't talk to the creative team, they don't talk to the event teams. So for us, we need to hire people just to manage advertising agencies or communication group. So I say, okay, let's go, let's create some villages. So I came back to Avas and I say, hey, look guys, I have a fantastic idea. So I'm the new CEO. Uh, <laughs> let's come together. And they all looked at me and they say, but we hate each other. <laughs> they, no, uh, the competition is not within the group, it's with outside. So we had to change the mindset of the people. We had to create this feeling of belonging to the same group this feeling of camaraderie. It was a huge, I mean, there was two aspects of the job. One was around culture. Yeah. How can we create a culture for the group? And second was around real estate because we moved everyone in every uh, different cities we're operating in, in the same uh, buildings or the same locations. But after two, three years, I can tell you that now the group operates as one. Uh, people feel that they belong to, to have us. And one thing that is I mean, very uh, dear to my heart is every year we are doing an engagement survey and I uh, encourage everyone here in the room or watching TV to do the same within your own company, within your company. So basically you ask some questions, very simple questions to your teams like, uh, do you believe that uh, your company has a bright future? Uh, do you like your colleagues? Uh, do you believe that uh, you will be in the company in the next two years? Uh, would you recommend this company to one friend to be working in? And we monitor this score, we call it the engagement score. And year after year, it's getting higher and higher. And you do it every year? Every year, every year. And what's interesting is it's also a canary in the coal mine. I mean, when I see the engagement score lowering, decreasing in some agencies, I can tell you six months or even one year before that the result, the revenue and the profitability will decrease. Wow. It's because the clients are not happy, but they don't necessarily tell. I mean, you can feel. So, I mean, monitoring the engagement of your employees, I mean, it's key to any business in the world, any industry. Uh, are your competitors going to replicate this? Well, maybe after they watch us on TV, yeah. <laughs> you like to live dangerously, don't you? <laughs> okay, uh, let's, let's pull out from Avas now. Um, the Vivendi Group, uh, we're not so familiar with the other parts of the Vivendi Group here in India. But it's like I use the word, uh, it is a colossus in the media landscape globally. Um, let's go look at a few of the verticals because I think they're interesting. And let's start with gaming. So Vivendi owns uh, Gameloft. They have mobile games here in India as well. And uh, very interestingly, Gameloft this year has bucked the trend that the industry is displaying in terms of the industry is actually shrinking and Gameloft has increased its revenues. So there's something very interesting and they are actually mobile game pioneers and there's a strategic business shift that they've done. Yannick, tell us more about it. No, I mean, that's a very uh, interesting uh, industry, gaming. Uh, it has been growing year on year for the past 15, 20 years, maybe since uh, ever. Uh, we saw a boom with casual gaming and hyper-casual gaming those past uh, five years. And uh, since during COVID, I mean, the, 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 the numbers were skyrocketing. And uh, for the past four to five quarters, we have seen a decrease in the industry. People are, pay, are playing less, uh, spending more money online uh, on uh, in-game purchase. And on the opposite game loft of mobile gaming company is posting very, very strong results. Uh, I think for two reasons. Number one, they have been very smart to move from, con from mobile games only to console games. Yeah. So now our games, because our games were high quality games, super high quality, 
We have been competing against hyper-casual game, very easy to make, to fabricate. And we thought, okay, our games are so good, why don't we try to put our games on console or uh, Nintendo Switch or this kind of uh, other platform? And we launched uh, our games on those platforms. It has been a great success. The last one we did a, in partnership with uh, Disney. Uh, uh, a it came out in September, isn't it? Yeah, a game, yeah, yeah exactly, called uh, Disney Dreamlight Valley. It's working like super well. The numbers are over the roof. We are launching a new game with Disney in March. Uh, we are also benefiting from the fact that uh, video platforms such as Netflix or Disney Plus or Apple are launching their vertical of video games. Yeah. And for those platforms, they need to have quality games. So they are asking companies such as Gameloft to produce games for them. So they are new clients. So we have, I mean, a conjunction of good elements. But what's interesting is that we discussed this strategy three years ago. I mean, it's not, it didn't come by surprise. So it wasn't a reaction to the fact that, uh, you know, post-pandemic uh, gaming, uh, you know, usage has gone down? No, we decided before the pandemic, and by the way, we had no idea the pandemic would come, yeah. uh, that we needed to go on the premium uh, games mm -hmm. and to try to move to console and find new clients such as Netflix or yeah. Nintendo or, or Microsoft. And today, uh, the strategy is paying off uh, heavily. To take this forward is uh, the metaverse. The metaverse, and everybody is making big bets on it, ex especially meta, of course, <laughs> and um, consultancies, business consultancies, isn't it? Because everybody wants to see this as a revenue potential going forward. What are your views on the metaverse? And I'm segueing into metaverse here because of gaming, and that's perhaps an industry that lends itself beautifully to the metaverse, isn't it? No, I mean, I'm a, it depends. I mean, to answer your question, we need to first agree on the definition of the metaverse, because there are two ways of seeing it. Yeah. Uh, I believe in platforms that will provide social interaction, mm -hmm. such as a video game. Uh, if you say that we call metaverse something that is an immersive experience with a helmet or... With devices, with, with headsets. Devices, I mean, the answer is, uh, I would say, would be different. Mm -hmm. Because what I don't know, well, I'm sure meta social platform like metaverse, uh, traditional metaverse such as video games, I don't know, Fortnite or the games we are producing at, uh, at Gameloft are already working. League of Legends, it's metaverse because you can interact with people through your avatar. You can buy clothes, you can buy skins, you can buy whatever you want, you can exchange products. So uh, I'm a huge believer on that. What I'm a little bit unsure of, and I should not tell that uh, in front of meta, is uh, immersive part because when I, I've tried it several times the oculus headset yeah mm. uh, so to the, maybe the next helmet will be much better but uh, it will be a barrier I would say to go uh, for people to spend 10 hours a day uh, yeah. or even uh, five hours a day uh, with the helmet so that's the only difference so social platforms interaction that uh, in which you will buy product like your car uh, we have someone from Tata I'm sure you would be ready to pay for the last electric uh, vehicle, Tata, because you think it looks good to show to your friend. If it's immersive, that's another question. But I believe in social interaction where people will pay. And, and by the way, we've been conducting some reviews, and it's interesting. Some people are spending more money to dress up their avatar than themselves. No, but I mean, it's a real market, huh? Trust me. CNBC TV 18, Marquee Nights. So let's look at Canal Plus. In this context today, this evening, let's talk about it purely from the streaming service because that's a priority for Vivendi, isn't it? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, Canal Plus operates as a, I would say, a traditional TV business, yeah. operated as a traditional TV business. And with the emergence of uh, OTT platform, it has completely changed the way uh, people were consuming products. Because before, in the past, you wanted to watch uh, the last uh, Bollywood movie or the last episode of your favorite show. You had to go in front of the linear TV to wait for the starting uh, time, uh, watch some advertising in the middle of it, uh, or sometimes uh, multiple advertising. Today, it's completely different. I mean, it has changed uh, five, 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 ten years ago. People want to be able to see uh, their show or series or movies uh, anytime. Uh, anywhere on the device they want. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to be able to digitalize all our platforms. That's, this is something we have been doing. The problem we had with Canal Plus, it was not about the digitalization because it, it, it's quite easy. I mean, it's quite easy to, to build. Well, it's not easy, huh, but the team have been doing a great job, let's say, in building the digital platform. It's even better for those who know the digital platform of Canal Plus. It's even better than the one of Netflix. I think it's one of the best in the world. Sorry for doing some advertising. But yeah, yeah. Canal Plus is a client. <laughs> Canal Plus is a client of Ava, so I have to do some advertising. Uh, but the problem we had was uh, that we were purely French, and uh, we were competing against a global group that can produce content and uh, air it on multiple countries and continents. So they have much more subscribers. So this is why the team of Canal Plus um, uh, have decided eight years ago to go global, to go overseas. Mm -hmm. And now uh, almost 70%, 70% of our subscribers are outside France. Our global uh, yeah. subscribers. Outside France, yeah. Talking about streaming, we've seen in the past year um, a pivot made by Netflix, who you mentioned, uh, from, I remember Reed Hastings at a Marky Knight's conversation said he would never, he wouldn't entertain ad-supported streaming on Netflix. And just this month, earlier this month, uh, Netflix has, uh, has launched its ad-supported program in the USA and, of course, in Europe. Um, what do you make of this? Because, you know, when Netflix uh, was successful and we saw all the subscriber editions during the pandemic, we were also quite excited about the fact that subscription revenues were beginning to pay and pay for high quality content. And today you are in 2022 saying that, okay, subscription revenues are drying up and go back to good old advertising revenues. Uh, what's your view on where this is going to land? I think the good thing is it's that it's much more affordable. Yeah. And um, uh, the Western world, especially in Europe and also in the US, but I know in the rest of the world as well, are uh, unfortunately uh, uh, discovering what is inflation because the cost of uh, living, of energy consumption is growing much uh, faster than the compensation. So people will have to make some savings. So I think timing wise, it's a, it's a smart move because some people that would have churned completely, I think maybe they will subscribe to this, uh, to this new model. But do you think subscription revenues will come good again if the macroeconomic environment changes? Do you think people, I think, okay, let me rephrase this question, Yannick. Are people willing to pay top dollar for high quality content? Uh, we did during the lockdown a survey about the relationship the consumers in the world and the people in the world have with entertainment. And for 83% of the respondents, they were saying that for them, entertainment, I mean, global entertainment, huh? TV, movies, uh, reading, uh, magazines, for 83% of them, it's a vital need. It's something that makes them feel good, that uh, gets uh, anxiety away, uh, that develop their culture. Uh, so I believe they are really willing to pay. And when you consider the price of those platforms, it's not, it's not very uh, expensive. When you compare uh, the price of uh, any platform to the price of going to a nice restaurant. Yeah, or watching a movie in India for that matter. A, so, yeah. you know, I think it's, I don't think it's uh, declining. I think it's gonna be more complex for purely uh, linear TV that are uh, free and relying on advertising. We're gonna shift an abrupt shift, but it, this is a story that has been consuming everybody who's interested in the media. Um, Twitter. <laughs> you know, Elon Musk, real-time tweeting, is remaking Twitter in, the, in full public view. He's taken the company private for $44 billion, but he's doing everything in full public view. And he is saying that advertising revenues, which is Twitter's mainstay by far, yeah. is going to be a problem. So let's go for subscription revenue. So he's doing exactly the opposite of what Netflix is doing. Of course, they don't compare what Twitter offers and what Netflix does. But what do you make of this? On Elon Musk himself, I remember when he launched, uh, or when he acquired Tesla, yeah. all our clients on uh, the traditional car manufacturers were telling me he will never succeed. His cars, their battery will burn. And when you see the results 10 years later, Tesla is... Uh, the highest uh, uh, car manufacturer in market cap. 
And uh, when uh, Elon Musk announced that uh, he will launch some rocket that will land back uh, on Earth, uh, everyone was laughing. And he did it. So that's why I wouldn't, you know, bet against him. him. I wouldn't and not bet against him. him. Yeah. Uh, then on Twitter, what's complex uh, for us is uh, what to tell to our clients. Uh, I mean, it's not about uh, what I think about the blue certification for $8 a month or something like that. I mean, it's a different subject. Uh, in terms of the advertising, we need to make sure, we need to be responsible. What we need to be making sure of is that our clients are investing in a safe environment. Because the last thing you want for a brand is to be part or in the middle of a hate speech or something like that. So I've been receiving emails to be transparent with you, uh, like maybe three emails a week for the past, past four weeks, explaining from the Twitter uh, advertising yeah. team that nothing was oh, changing. The, the, the team is still there? Yeah, that, that was my point. Uh, so they are sending emails <laughs> saying everything is fine. Elon is a big fan of, uh, of a good environment and safe environment, but they are, uh, uh, well, none of them are still working in the company. <laughs> so, so I just received an email on the way down from, the, from my room upstairs that the French CEO has resigned, so, but I'm sure. <laughs> So we'll see. So, uh, I mean, uh, we'll be there. The question is uh, uh, just make sure uh, that the environment is safe for brands. Otherwise, uh, it will backlash against the brand and they will... Uh, so would you, are you advising uh, Avas's brands to pause? I mean, it's just, I mean, Twitter, it's not like Meta. Uh, it's not like Google. Uh, Meta and Google are two-thirds of the digital investment. Uh, Twitter is uh, even less than 1%. Yeah. Let's say 1%. In to be, India to be too. Yeah. So it's, it's not, not going to be a game changer for brands to, to post. We are telling them that you need to make sure, and we need to make sure on your behalf, that you will be on a safe environment. So this is, a, I hope, the constructive discussion that we are having with, uh, with Twitter teams now. It seems that they are changing rapidly, so uh, I will be more safe to answer in one month, maybe two months, to see about... Uh, that is a, the, the main point for us is uh, just to make sure that safe. Uh, we Everything are safe. safe for your brand. Yeah, I think it was fabulous, first of all, to organize it in a place like this, very unconventional. And uh, Yannick spoke very well. And you know, the key takeaway was, I think you got an insight, not just into Vivendi, but also into the future of media and the way he sees it. I think uh, some of the things that came to me today was, uh, I think the dichotomy between subscription and advertising revenue, uh, what's going to happen with Twitter, and and I think uh, it was a very interesting dis uh, discussion. Yeah, it's great listening to a person like Yagnik because, uh, you know, when I was studying at HBS Harvard, I read uh, studies on Vivendi as a group. Uh, they have been 200 years around. It's not easy for any organization to be there for so long. Uh, it requires constant change and transformation. And I think they have done brilliantly. And uh, uh, that was the most interesting part, right? That how do you transform yourself into a digital organization, uh, compete with all the startups, you know? One of the specific things I think uh, which he spoke about was that uh, what is their worst nightmare? He, he prepares himself for that as an organization. It's something very important and very uh, was very nice for all of us. I think the perspective that he brought to the table uh, comes from a very deep and vast international experience. I think his views on globalization, the emergence of media, what's the future of metaverse, uh, specifically around gaming, etc., is very uh, important for marketers to understand. And I think also the fact that India is going to be a key media market and a key economy in which uh, global media interest is going to converge was very heartening to learn for me. I think the uh, conversation was really very, very authentic, uh, very genuine kind of answers uh, given by uh, the guest because, I mean, uh, I, I don't think he was kind of uh, sidestepping any of the questions uh, that were being asked. He was kind of really invested in, I think, the replies that he was uh, making. So I think it was a really interesting conversation. Through the conversation and through which wave, how Anuradha had crafted the questions and everything, I think that was very interesting. It gave a lot of insights around the industry. It gave a lot of insights around what is happening and also had a futuristic kind of a feel. We have unique opportunities to influence human behaviors. Unique opportunities to 
tell our clients that they need to be working not only to sell product and at an affordable price, but they need to be working to contribute to communities, to make sure people feel better if they consume their products. This is what we have called the, how to make a meaningful difference to brands and businesses. CNBC TV 18, Marquee Nights. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.